So it appears that Mr. Linus' last name Tectives is encroaching upon my territory. With the creation of LTT Labs, it seems he's gotten himself the nice budget $50,000 rig to up his headphone measurements game. Finally, I might add, his audio reviews at this point are kind of low level for a channel his size. But there's still a rather big question that we now need to address. Is all of this even necessary? First of all, let me just introduce myself since I'm expecting a lot of you to come in asking who is this guy, what is his credentials, who is he to go against the almighty word of the great L-Man himself. So hello, my name is Chronicle, I run Chronicle.com in Irfidality and I currently host and maintain the <clears throat> literal world's largest public database of headphone and earphone measurements spec to IEC 60318-4 and IEC 60318-7. More on that later. In my database, there's currently more than a couple hundred headphones as well as more than a literal thousand IEMs slash earphones. And my measurements are known to be a common reference point within the audio manufacturing industry, so I guess I must be doing something, right? Just like my sponsor said, Shenzhen Audio. If you haven't heard of them already, please get out of the rock that you're living under. They are one of the biggest and most trusted chai fi retailers today and stock all manner of audiophile products ranging from DAX, AMPs, DAPs, headphones, and of course, IEMs, but you already knew that. Shenzhen Audio also promises the lowest prices guaranteed and a 30-day no questions asked return policy so you can feel safe with your purchase with them, regardless of whether you balled out with $20,000 or $20. Go to shenzhenaudio.com and let them know I sent you. Support the people who support me. But let's not talk about myself. After all, this is all about Linus and his brand spanking new purchase. I guess with this latest purchase, the question now arises, is he going in the right direction? Did he make a good investment or did he just completely fuck up and now he has to start from scratch? Long story short, yeah, I think it's on the right track. He hired the right people for the job. Most of the things that he said in the video is largely accurate, albeit a little bit dumbed down for the more mainstream audience. And I, for one, am excited to see how all of this pans out. But if you're here for the long story, then buckle down, kiddo, because I am going to unleash my nerd vomit onto all of y'all. Now, this video, as you can see, is going to be kind of extremely long. So please make full use of the timestamps and chapters because I know most of you have the attention span of a peanut. Now let's now talk about the things that makes these measurements. The measuring rigs. What do they do? How do they work? And more importantly, why are they seemingly so goddamn expensive? From a very basic standpoint, it seems like all you need is just a flat microphone, stick it into some yoga blocks, stick on some headphones, wham, bam, done. Right? No. The problem with headphone measurements is that there's two main things that we have to simulate. First of all would be the pinna, which is the, this fleshy thing that's on my face, as well as the ear canal that extends all the way into our eardrums. Simply shoving a microphone into a headphone isn't really going to get you the most accurate results. And it's at the point where we start to simulate all of these body parts. Oh dear, at that point, the cost is just go whoop. First, let's start with the part that we have to simulate regardless of whether or not we are going to be measuring headphones or IEMs. The ear canal. One of the very first designs for an inner ear simulator is the 2CC coupler, which was invented in 1942 by Romanov and is now governed under IEC 60318-5. If it sounds complicated, don't worry, it's actually extremely simple. It's literally just a tube of a volume of 2 cm cubed. 2 milliliters. In fact, one of my earliest IEM measuring rigs inadvertently follows this very standard. But even the IEC standard makes it very clear. The sound pressure developed by an earphone is not in general the same in the coupler as in a person's ear. That just means that it's going to be inaccurate compared to the actual human response. But what it is good at is being very consistent and honestly Kind of hard to fuck up. Just shove the IM in there, play your sign sweep or your white noise or your whatever. Bam. Graph. Easy. The 2cc coupler is a valid alternative for those who just want quick and dirty measurements without going too deep into all of the weeds of measurement rigs. For example, if you were a sound engineer touring with a band and you just needed to check the channel imbalance on your IEMs, you could just get a 2cc coupler in order to get all those fancy ones. All you need is just a microphone 
and a tube. My own DIY 2cc coupler was less than 30 bucks all in and let me tell you it generated pretty damn good results. All I really did was just shove in like vinyl tubing into a microphone and that's it. But it's not really appropriate if you're trying to make an industry recognized database kind of like what Linus is trying to do. Given that the 2cc coupler isn't really representative of the average human ear canal, now there needs to be something that better simulates the acoustic impedance of the inner ear. So now we move on to the 1970s where a man by the name of Joseph Swislocki invents the Swislocki coupler, a very creative name I know. The Swislocki coupler is the precursor to the 7-Eleven coupler that everyone seems to be using nowadays. And this coupler, is used in the construction of the very first industry-recognized hidden torso simulator by the name of the Keymar, but uh, more on that later. Now we fast forward into 1981 where the IEC 60711 standard goes into full effect spearheaded by Brew and Care and their type 4157. This is eventually updated to the IEC 60318-4 standard, a standard that everyone is using till today and the standard to which my IEM coupler is built to. But rather than keep using this string of letters all the time, we just opted to use the term 7-Eleven couplers to reference all of these couplers, even though, you know, the 6 7 eleven standard isn't being used today. I hope that answers that burning question for some of you fucking nerds. Now, a few years back, Grass did their own little spin on the IEC 60318-4 standard with the Grass RA040X, which is still basically a 7-Eleven coupler, just with the resonance peak significantly dampened. The claim is that this dampening gets the coupler closer to actual human response, and also allows users to differentiate between coupler resonance and driver resonance a lot more easily. Now, I'm not here to confirm or deny these claims, but I myself have a Grass RA0402, but again, more on that later. But these are just inner ear simulators. What Linus has ordered is called the Head and Torso Simulator, or HATS for short. Though in Linus's case, it's not really getting a torso, so in this case, it's not really a HATS. More like a... Before we move on to the next topic, I need to give some additional context on what exactly the Big 3 is. The Big 3 is a reference to the three main manufacturers of ear simulators today, consisting of Brew and Care, Grass, as well as Head Acoustics. If you ever see any industry standard measurements of headphones or IEMs, there is a good chance that it is done on equipment built by one of the Big 3 though that is also in the assumption that they are not using clone equipment. Again, more on that later, I know I keep saying that. On top of the pinnut, each hat also needs to contain a inner ear simulator. As I mentioned earlier, one of the first industry recognized hatses was the Keymar, the Nulls Electronics Mannequin. Where the fuck is the R? The first Keymar was built in 1972 using Swiss Lockheed couplers. Eventually, future Keymars are built with 7-Eleven couplers, and all of that gave rise to the IEC TR60959 standard, which eventually was updated to IEC 60318-7. Eventually, Grass bought over the rights to Keymar, so even though the acronym Keymar literally has the word nulls in it, most people still refer to it as the Grass Keymar because that's the grass's hat. Now, let's move on from IEC standards to ITUT standards. Wow, very exciting, I know. ITUT recommendation P57 and P58 govern ear simulators and is the standard to which two of the big three follow an influence, namely Brew and Care as well as head acoustics. Now, the previous generation of headsets, which is the Brew and Care 4128, as well as the head acoustics HMS 2.3, used the ITUT Type 3.3 pinner, which was standardized in 1993. Grass used their own pinner, namely the KB0065, as well as the subsequent KB5000, which doesn't follow any ITUT standards, but still comply to IEC 6038-7. Now, the big mix-up here is with the new generation of headsets, namely the Brew and Care Type 5128, as well as the Head Acoustics HMS 2.3L and HEC. Oh, there's so many letters. A research paper helmed by the scientists at Brewer and Care back in 2018 found that the 7-Eleven coupler that we have all been using for the last 40 years 
is wrong. Through a study of 32 subjects, and not an ideal sample size, but Vegas can't be choosers, it seems that the 7-Eleven coupler has been underrepresenting low-frequency leakage effects, and so measurements made on the 7-Eleven coupler may seem a lot basier than it may be in real life. They took these results and started developing the type 4620, a coupler that is radically different from any 7-Eleven coupler. This new coupler basically attempts to simulate the entirety of the ear canal all the way down to the drum reference point and promises to be the bleeding edge of ear simulators today. And in case you're wondering why 4620 is so different from 5128, it is because 4620 is just the ear simulator. The 5128 on the other hand is the entire hats which contains two 4620s. And eventually the 4620 also becomes a new ITUT standard as the Type 4.3 in 2021. Now on the side of head acoustics, head acoustics saw the research and basically went, hey, uh, we hear you, we like what you're doing, but we still want to use the 7-Eleven. So for their new heads in the HMS 2.3L and HEC, all they did was take the Type 4.3 pinner, chop the ear canal in half, and then just shove the box standard 7-Eleven on top of it. The, just because. The best part is that ITUT saw this and just went, yeah, okay. And just bloody gave them the standard anyways. Look it up, ITUT Type 4.4. It's, it's actually a real thing. And now we go back to Linus again, where he has to make the choice between the Brew and Care Type 5128, the Head Acoustics, HMS 2.3L and HEC, as well as the Grass Kima, which apparently the engineers thought was hot garbage. Now there was a bachelor number three right here, but our headphone test engineer has actually worked with that model before and thinks that it is Crap. Between the 5128 and the HEC, I can see why the LTT lab went with the 5128. After all, it is the more complete version of the HEC. And there's really no reason to go for the HEC unless you already own a HMS 2.3 and are just wanting to do a swap upgrade. As for the grass schema, the main reason why you would go with that is because you want your data to be more easily compatible with Harman research. After all, the Harman target was done on a grass setup and therefore data from there is not immediately compatible with hatses from other manufacturers. Now you still could extrapolate a Harman target for something like the 5128, but it's still gonna be extra work and the results are not gonna be 100% accurate regardless. Now to answer the overarching question, could LTT labs have gone for a much cheaper alternative? They could. But given their ambition, I can see why they didn't. A more budget version of the 4620 would just be a standard 7-Eleven coupler. The Brew and Care Type 4195, the Grass 0045 or the Grass 040X, or just your standard HMS 2.3. The general 7-Eleven standard has been around for 40 years, so any data that you generate from there can be much more easily comparable with the data that's already out there. An even more budget version of that would be the 2CC coupler, but given that they want to create a more industry-recognized database, I can see why they did it. Now, if they were going with grass, they could have considerably gone for something like the 45CA or the 43AG, which omits the less important parts for a more significant discount. Other more budget solutions to a full hat would be more DIY solutions. For example, the aforementioned flat plate system where you just shove a microphone into yoga blocks or some shit. But those are just super jank and it's more reserved for DIYers with more time than money. There's also the mini DSP ears, a a freakish ears on a stand. But it has no inner ear simulation and has honestly a terrible pinner. The acoustic impedance is just absolutely wrong and it's only marginally better than a flat plate system only for its convenience factor. This also extends to things like the ASMR binaural microphones and other things like the Neumann KU100s. Please do not use them for headphone measurements. I beg you. But there is another option cheap Chinese clones. 7-Eleven clones are now all the rage in the IEM world and basically every reviewer and their mother owns one. Each one is only about a couple of hundred bucks at most and most of them don't even require a power conditioner or phantom power so it's really very accessible to the general crowd. Today, there are even clones of the Grass 43AG which I have affectionately referred to as the GRS. They perform far better than any mini DSP ear setup or flat plate 
estate setup, the only downside is that it's relatively high in cost. They're still not very accurate to the real thing. They still require a lot of compensation to be generally usable, but still a viable choice for the average hobbyist. So to answer another big question, why exactly are all of these industry standard measuring rigs so expensive? Number one, they are highly specialized pieces of equipment and they sell at very, very low volume. So they can't really make money if they sell at razor thin margins. Number two, all of these equipment are highly, highly calibrated. So different sets of the same model can still be directly comparable to one another. Number three, years, if not decades of R&D costs relating to having to simulate the human hearing much more accurately, they have to recoup that cost somehow. At the end of the day, I applaud the LTT lab staff for this very significant endeavor. And I hope that this helps to make headphone measurements a lot more accessible to the average person. But I do have some words of caution to the crew going forward. Number one, do not overly focus on distortion graphs. Distortion graphs may seem very intuitive, but in all honesty, they tell you not a lot. Distortion tells you if a headphone is bad, but it is not an indication if a headphone is good. 10% distortion, sure, the headphone is bad. 0.01% versus 0.001%, that really doesn't tell you much. Number two, time domain is useless for headphones. Headphones and IEMs are mostly minimum phase devices, so graphs like waterfall plots and group delayed measurements are largely useless. Again, they may look pretty and intuitive, but whatever is reflected in the frequency domain should be similarly reflected in the time domain. Don't waste your time. Don't mislead people, please. Number three, don't pull a Jude. Jude Mansilla of HeadFi was one of the first people to receive a production unit of a Type 5128. He made grand claims, started promoting it as the next big thing, and I'm sure that he was instrumental in bringing it into the enthusiast consciousness. But the big issue is that he never really provided a lot of data on the 5128. You could probably count with your hands the number of 5128 measurements that he publishes annually. I don't want to assume too much on what he does in the back end, but on the front end, the, it's very clear. He is not active. Be consistent. Keep publishing data. Build a database that allows comparisons. Don't just use a graph as a brief snippet in a video. At that point, you might as well just have gotten a mini DSP years. And finally, number four, no sound demos. Sound demos are just frequency response graphs with extra steps. If any of your staff members insist that you have to record a sound demo on a 5128, fire them. All right, that's it. I'm out of words. I'm done. I am extremely happy for the future of the hobby, but at the same time, I need to get all of this out of my chest because if I had to know all of this, so do you. Now, I thank all of my big money boys. Thank you to all of you who have subscribed to the $20 tier on my Patreon. And for those $30 big boys, allow me to speak out your beautiful names. McMadface, Dennis, Laughing Psychonaut, Jerry, HK57, Fisk, Newt, TJ Daily, Charlie Row 222 Krina Gal, Rodrigo, The Angry Persian, Alicia Burrito, Zuni Roar, Alex, Corbin, Andrew, Dizzy, Kevin, Nice, Luigi, and Nanonandi. Uh, thank you all. The amount of research that went into this video is absolutely insane. I, I I wish I could show you guys the script that I wrote for this video. It's like, holy motherfucker. Oh my god. But regardless, I hope that I've made what usually is a very, very dry topic into something that somewhat interests you. And if not, well, uh, please forgive me. With that in mind, see you next week, kind of, and don't die. Fuck off. Mm -hmm.